Hi, welcome to the Sunshine Courses Bookkeeping from Scratch uh, training. My name is Nigel, I'm your presenter for today. Uh, the purpose of this training is to help anyone that wants to keep their own books of accounts and that doesn't know how to do it. Perhaps they've just started their business from scratch or they've been doing their books and they're very unsure about what to do. Or perhaps you've been doing books and feel you want a better understanding of what you're doing to see if you can get more out of your accounting. And the purpose of this session is to help you understand what accounts are, how to do accounts, and at the end, how to prepare accounts that are meaningful. So hopefully by the end of this session, you can simply go away and start to keep your own books. That's the hope of this training session. So what are we going to cover? Firstly, we'll just touch on what bookkeeping is. Might seem a bit obvious, but sometimes it's a good idea just to touch base. At least it helps with the language of what we're doing from going forward. So what is bookkeeping? And then we're going to talk about three different types of accounting. And the different types of accounting depend on what you're trying to achieve from the accounts yourself. So you're going to select out of these which you think is right for you. And if the first one is right, you can stop at that point, but you're welcome to go further forward if you want to. And you can, of course, get up later if you want to start uh, simple and get more sophisticated later. But the three types of accounting are cash flow accounting, where you're accounting based just on the cash flows of a business, invoice accounting, where you incorporate accounting for invoices, and then something called accruals accounting, which is when you get grown up and do accounting for transactions, even if the invoices aren't there. And we're gonna to finally touch on laws and taxes, just to give a bit of a context within which you're operating. And then if we get time, and if you're interested, there's a final section called social responsibility accounting, which is if you want to add to your normal accounting, how you manage to develop your business in a way which supports the community which is socially responsible. So we'll touch on that at the end. But to start with, what is bookkeeping? Seems a bit obvious. Essentially, bookkeeping is the story of your business. Accounting is telling the story of your business. And the things, the key information that you're trying to extract from accounting, the key story you're trying to tell is firstly, is your business profitable enough? And that's normally displayed in something called a profit and loss account. Is your business profitable enough? If it's not profitable enough, which areas of the business can you focus on to increase the profitability? Can you save costs? Can you focus more on your more profitable activities? That's what the profit side of the accounting is all about. And the other side, the other story you're telling, the other part of the story you're telling is, is there enough money to fund the business? It's all good and well having a business that's profitable, but if you need to go and buy huge quantities of stock, you need to have assets in order to trade in the first place, if you don't have enough money to do that, you can't trade. So the question is, is there enough money to fund the business? And that's what the balance sheet helps us identify. And if the answer to that is yes, the question, of course, is, is there too much money? Can you withdraw some money from the business and still stay profitable? And if the answer is no, what can you do to get either extra funding or to change the business so you need less funding in the first place? So bookkeeping is all about telling the story of your business. Is it profitable enough? And is there enough money to fund the business? So without further ado, we can go straight on to the first section, um, cash flow accounting. So we're going to cover in cash flow accounting, um, classifying bank receipts and payments. Generically, I call it accounting categories or accounts. How to account using a spreadsheet. How to account using accounting software. We'll then talk about the profit and loss account and a couple of really important sections. One is how you pick up errors with a bank reconciliation. And there's another section about an audit trail and VAT, 
which are a couple of specific items you need just to get started with cash flow accounting. But the whole point of accounting is probably easier to sum up with an example. So I'm going to switch over to a spreadsheet. And this spreadsheet illustrates what we're trying to do with bookkeeping. I've listed out a number of receipts and payments that were paid in February 2021. Now, this is just a random selection of entries. And uh, typically in an accounting, when you're doing account, there'll be double, quadruple, or many thousands times the number of transactions. But the principles are the same. And throughout this uh, training session, I'm going to be using these simple examples, just a dozen or so transactions, because it's a bit easier to understand if there's smaller numbers of transactions. But as I said, the principles apply equally to everything that we're doing. So typically with a bookkeeping, when you're doing bookkeeping, you'll start off with a bunch of receipts and payments. So in this case, the first couple of items are some receipts from Sunshine Traders, 121 pounds, Rewind Limited, 1,000 pounds, and going down a bit, we've then got some expenses. We've got some stationary costs from sole stationers and Frank Properties, properties we spent some money on warehouse. The purpose of bookkeeping is to make sense of these transactions, to tell a story in a meaningful way, which helps you identify if you're making enough profits and if you've got enough funding. So for the first part of this training, we're gonna be talking, looking at the profits and exploring the question of, do we have enough profits? So that's the purpose of what we're trying to achieve. We're gonna go back to the presentation. So the basic principle of cash flow accounting is that you'll have various receipts and payments in a month. And cash flow accounting accounts for transactions in the month in which they are received and paid. Sounds really simple. I'm going to repeat it because you'll see with some of the other accounting, uh, this principle gets modified. So this is really to lay the basis of the principles for future. But the basic of cash flow accounting is we account for receipts and payments in the month in which they are received and paid. So it's important to know that when we talk about accounts, we always talk about an accounting period. You can never understand accounts if you don't know which period the accounts relate to. So typically in this case, we're doing accounts on a monthly basis. We could just as easily have done them on a quarterly basis um, or on an annual basis. And typically, when we do our own accounts, we'll want to see the account on a monthly basis so we can keep track ourselves of what's going on. But in addition to that, we'll have to do a annual accounting for things like taxes and for banks and for other organizations who might want to assess our business. They're not really interested in the monthly figures. They're much more interested in the higher level picture of the annual figures. So the point of accounting is you're always talking about an accounting period. And in this example, we're talking about monthly accounts. And in the month of January, we account for receipts and payments that were, were put through in January. And in February, the same thing. And in March, the same thing. So the basic principle of cash flow accounting is we account for transactions in the month in which they're received and paid. But when we say account for them, we've seen these for slightly higgledy-piggledy receipts and payments we need to put them in some type of meaningful order. And the way in which we put them in a meaningful order is that we categorize accounts in a way that's meaningful. So the way we categorize accounts, we'll always distinguish income from expenses. And with our income, typically we'll have sales and we'll have interest. Those are the type of accounting categories we want to, to know about. And depending on the type of business, 
you may want several categories of sales. So rather than just having simple total sales, you may want to get a bit more detail than just the sales alone. So for example, you're a clean business, you may be able to want to distinguish whether you've, how much of your sales are to residential customers and how much to business customers. If you're a consulting is, uh, business, you're doing advice or consulting, it may be that you're more interested to know which sectors or which industries are showing more interest in what you do. And it could be in some of those sectors, you're doing much better than others. And it could be you should just dispense with a couple of sectors and focus in a couple of others, particularly if that means you can gain some specialist, uh, specialist expertise and start to charge even more for that particular work for less cost. So your accounts are helping you identify how much money you're making from each sector in order to be able to identify, are you making enough profits and can you do better? If you're a car dealer, sales may be split between the make and model of cars. If you're builders, you may want to split it between the building work you do, the decoration work you do, and the maintenance work you do. And if you're a charity, you may be interested not so much in sales, but in donations. And you might just simply have a category for donations and that will cover everything. But as a charity, you may want to even get more granulated than just donations. You may want to distinguish the regular monthly donations from grants, from say government or from organizations who are commissioning certain types of work um, or legacies. It may be that you want, you've got a separate organization, separate part of the charity that's encouraging legacies. And it's useful to know how successful they are relative to their costs. So the point I'm trying to um, highlight in this section is that the categories depend on your type of business as to what type of categories you want. But what you're trying to do is to identify information that will help you to run your business or your organization. And only you can know that. And sometimes even you won't know it, particularly if you're starting a business, because you don't necessarily know which direction the business is going to go in. So sometimes you'll start off with categories and you may well find you change them as you get more sophisticated and as you get a better understanding and a better handle of what you're doing in your business. So if the income categories are relatively simple, split in terms of sales interest, sometimes some other categories, for example, donations, the expenses tends to be split into four types of expenditure. Again, how you split it depends on your business, but typically you'll have trading costs. And the idea of trading cost is to separate out the costs that relate directly to sales. So an example of a cost that relates directly to sales is if you're the car dealer and you sell a particular type of car, a trading cost would be the purchase cost of that car. Um, and if you're a cleaning business and you're uh, out uh, cleaning premises, the material, materials you use when you go into the building, the chemicals you use, the cloths you use, what you use directly to create those sales, that would go into trading costs. And the idea of splitting trading costs is that when you compare the trade cost with the sales, you get a sense of how well you're doing relative to each individual sale. And the difference is called the markup, the, the amount, the extra you charge above your basic costs in terms of your sales. And sometimes that's a useful, useful way for managing your business. And again, the specific categories within trading costs you would have depend on the type of business. So if you're a business that sells goods and services, the trading costs tend to be much higher percentage of sales than if you're, for example, a consultant, where the consultant has very little in the way of direct costs. And so typically a trading organization would have more categories within the trading costs than a consulting. But again, it all depends on what you're trying to achieve with your own accounts to understand your accounts better. So trading costs tend to be one category, staff costs tend to be another, and that's typically because staff costs quite a lot of money. And you might just have one or two members of staff, in which case it might be simple. You might have quite a lot of members of staff, in which case you may distinguish the types of staff that you've got. It could be you'll distinguish your sales staff from your admin staff, for example. 
Premises cost is another one that typically is a, a big cost for a business. So typically we want to be able to distinguish how much we're spending on our premises and rent and rates, light and heat, um, maintenance costs of the premises, those sorts of costs go into premises costs. Again, the categories, the split you have depends on the nature of the premises you've got, how significant it is compared with the whole and how much detail you want to get into. And then the final category of costs that people tend to have is administration. And the admin costs tend to be things like um, accounting costs uh, or statutory compliance. It's the sort of costs that are generic that don't vary depending on each individual item of sale you've got. Um, but uh, nevertheless, they relate to the business. And sometimes admin costs are pretty insignificant in which case you don't need to get into much detail with them. But in some businesses, admin costs are the majority of your costs. Typically, if you have a consulting business, that often happens. And the admin costs, may, it may well be that you want to analyze them in quite a lot more detail. So these are generic categories. And the question you may have is, well, how do you know as a business, particularly if you're just starting from scratch, where do you even start? So I'm gonna go back to an example And what I've done here is I've created a typical profit and loss account. And if you don't have better categories that you already know about and you don't know where to start, these are a very typical set of categories which you can use to get started. And very quickly, you'll know where you need to add costs or to merge them if you don't need as many as the uh, categories as you've got. So in this particular example, I'm showing sales of £120,000 Interest is fairly irrelevant, but I didn't want to put my interest in my sales just in case for some reason I want to separate them out. Then I've got a separate section for cost of sales. In the example I just gave you, that was the trading costs. And the trading costs in this case are purchases. I included in that production staff. So in this particular example, they've got staff who make goods um, or do things with the purchases in order to be able to sell them. And those are deemed by this business to be the production, the cost of sales. And the warehouse costs, maybe if I've got a warehouse where I store goods specifically where I'm doing work on them to resell them, for example, it could be that this business says, look, this is part of my trading costs. Another business would look at it differently, but in this particular example, the difference between the income and the cost of sales was 30,000 pounds. That's my gross profit. And then the administrative expenses are split, as you can see, admin staff costs, office rent, light and heat. And these are very typical categories. So if you don't know what you want to allocate within your categories, what I suggest is use these. And let me just say, you don't need to write these down. This spreadsheet will be available on the sunshine.courses website, uh, and you'll be able to download it. And everything that we show from this spreadsheet, you can, uh, you'll be able to see directly, including playing around with it if you want to put in some different numbers to see what happens. Um, so you don't need to write it down, uh, but there it is if you want it. So that's the concept. We've got a lot of transactions. Let's go back to these unprocessed transactions. A lot of transactions. How do we convert this fairly uh, uh, vague or, or Un unorganized set of receipts and payments, how do we convert those to something that's meaningful like a profit and loss account? So there are two ways I want to show you. One is simply using a spreadsheet and one is using accounting software. And first I'm gonna show you the spreadsheet and I'm gonna show you the spreadsheet here. So here's a set of transactions and it probably goes without saying, but let me say it anyway, that if you're doing spreadsheet accounting, you have to list all your receipts and payments in a spreadsheet. So this is a typical way of showing it. You'll show the date, the payee or the payer. Payee is um, the person who is being paid by you. The payer is someone who's paying you. I've listed down here the details. If you just don't list the details in your, this is called a cash book. If you don't list the details in your cash book, you might, not, you might know who Sunshine Traders are, but you might not know what it is that they paid you money for. 
or CAPS insurance brokers is probably insurance, but what type of insurance is it? In this case, it's insurance of office as distinct from insurance of warehouse. Um, gone Aries petrol stations, petrol costs, we put down petrol costs, but we could equally put petrol costs for a particular job if we wanted to do so. So the idea of having the details is so that at a later date, you can know what the payments are for, the receipts and payments, without having to go back to the invoice itself. So we talked about creating accounting categories. The trick within the accounting system is to go through each item of receipts and payments and to allocate the category that you have chosen for your accounts to each item. So I've actually done this already. I'm just going to show you what I've done. I've got account classifications, and these account classifications are the classifications from the profit and loss accounts I showed you beforehand. This is where I have determined in advance how I want my accounts to look. And the point, the purpose of the bookkeeping is to say for each receipts and payments, which category should they relate to so that I can then create accounts based on these categories. And the classifications I put to this is for the uh, sunshine trade as the sale of product products, that's sales. If I go through all my receipts and payments, let me just have a quick look at the profit and loss categories, all of them I've got. Sales is the most appropriate category for sunshine traders for sale of product. And of course, if I've got more sophisticated sales, I'm going back to my profit and loss account. If rather than sales, I put down sales to business and separately sales to residential, if there were two lines instead of the one line in the profit and loss account, I'd have two categories, one sales of residential and one sales of business. But in this case, I'm just doing the one sales category. So I've just got the one accounts classification. And then when I look at the stationery, I've got a category printing, postage and stationery. So any costs I have for printing, if I'm printing posters, if I'm printing envelopes, uh, if I'm printing flyers, that would go into print, posters, and stationery. In this case, went to sold stationers and I haven't put in here in the cash bill what stationery is, I've simply put stationery, but it might be paper, it might be pens. I could have put it down there, but whatever it is, the most appropriate accounts classification is printing, posters, and stationery. And then going through Frank properties, we've got the rent of the warehouse. And lower down, you'll see Frank properties here, there's a different, which is rent of admin costs. And I still call it rent, but one is rent of warehouse, one is rent of offices. So just as And then Axial Limited, we purchase some products, that goes to purchases, that's the most appropriate category. And CAPS Insurance Brokers, Insurance of Warehouse, I've actually got an accounts category, Insurance of Warehouse. So having classified each of these accounts, the next step is to collate them into some type of meaningful way so that I get my total of all sales, my total of all prints, postage and stationery, my total of all purchases, and you can already see, we're starting to get the, the basis of accounts. So again, I've pre-done this to say doing this as we're going through, but I've created a separate column for each account. I'm gonna go back to the profit and loss account. For each account that we've got on here, I'm going back to, this, to the cash book, I've got a separate column which correlates. And so whenever I've identified anything that says sales, I've put that amount in the sales column. So Sunshine Trade is 121 pounds. I put in the sales column because that's the accounts classification sales. And I've done the same with all the other sales. The next category is print, postage and stationery. This is a payment. And if I go to the, um, my categorizations, I've got a category admin stationery. I don't know why I've called it stationery in the columns as opposed to print posters and stationery in the classification here, they should be the same. I think it was, I couldn't fit, I couldn't fit it in the column. Uh, it was too wide. So there's just a mechanical thing, but it's not really a problem. But so I've gone through each of these receipts and payments and I've classified them and put the amount into the classification, 
When I now total up these amounts, can you see I've already got the figures which form the basis of the accounts? I now know in the month of February, how much I've got for sales, 2,440 pounds. This is much more meaningful than simply looking down here where I've got to sort of top these things up in my head. I know what my purchases are, they're 1,400 pounds. I know what my markup is because I know the difference between these two. I know how much I've paid in total for my warehouse. Notice there's more than one item in the warehouse costs. There's the rent, but there's also the insurance costs. So I've got several items have gone up to me by cost of sales in the warehouse or two. And the same thing with my admin rent, insurance, travel and stationery. So already, just from having done this, I've got my first set of accounts. But this is a bit of an unhelpful way to show the accounts because it's still a bit confusing. So if I was now going to finish this off, I would create my profit and loss account in the format that I know that I want to have it. I would transfer each of the figures to this profit and loss account. So the 2,441 pounds of sales, I would put in this, in this category here and so on until my profit and loss account was simply a prettier format of these figures so that I can see that my total profit is 225 pounds. So if I went through and put all of these figures in this profit and loss account, I did not end up with a net profit of um, a net profit of 225 pounds. Okay. So if you want to stop at this point, this is how you do spreadsheet accounting. And already you can now prepare some accounts. Before you finish the section, so even if you don't want to get onto the computerized accounting, jump forward to the bank reconciliation because there's another part of this. It's a really big deal that I really urge you to watch without which I don't think you can do accounts properly. But subject to the bank reconciliation, you're already able to produce your own fairly simple accounts. So congratulations. Having said that, we've got a fairly small number of transactions. And what you'll find is the more transactions you have, the more painful this process becomes, the easier is it, is, it is to make mistakes. And um, so the rationale for doing computerized accounting is to handle much, much larger numbers of transactions and to speed it up. So I'll explain how that works in just a minute. Um, but I want to just, before I go on to the computerized accounting, I want to highlight one point, which is quite a critical point. I'm going to um, transfer this figure of 2441 to this profit and loss account. Okay, and if you just imagine, pretend all of these numbers equal the rest of these numbers. I want to draw your attention to the fact that this sales figure is made up of quite a number of different sales. And typically within accounts, each item within the accounts is made up of quite a lot of different amounts, different items. It's very often when you're looking at accounts, you want to go backwards from the final accounts to see what individual transactions make up those accounts. It could be you simply need to understand how you got those sales. It may be the end of the month, it may be one or two months later and you've forgotten how those sales were made up, but you need to remember for some reason, you're trying to analyze what you're doing, you're trying to talk with customers, you need to remember what those sales are made up of. The question is, how do you go backwards to identify what the items are that go to make this up? Because this is such a common requirement, I would say if you don't do what I'm about to tell you, you're not keeping your accounts properly. Um, if, for example, the tax people came to you and said, um, prove to me that light and heat of 9,600 pounds is legitimate. If you can't prove it to me, I'm not going to allow it as a cost and you'll have to pay more tax to me. How would you go back to prove to them what that light and heat is made up of to confirm it is light and heat rather than 
say heating up your house, which is not an expense that you can charge against your business. So we talk about something called an audit trail, which is the way by which you can move back from the accounts to the individual transactions. And the way an audit trail works is this. However you've made up your accounts, you need to have the document from which these figures are compiled. In this case, it's a cash book. Might be other stuff, but in this case, it's a cash book. And the cash book, this item 2,441 pounds, must tally. You must be able to link directly that number with this number. So if, for example, we got three or four columns of sales, but we consolidated them in the profit and loss accounts, we would have to have some way of going back from this total composite figure back to the individual figures in this cash book. And it could be we did it by way of creating a formula. So this figure might be a formula of two or three columns. However we do it, it could be, for example, underneath here, we'd, we'd put a, an additional item saying um, combined in sales. We might do that. But we need to be able to go back from our profit and loss accounts to the individual columns that relate to these transactions, back to each individual item. And then even further than that, I want to be able to go back to the invoice or the individual document which confirms that this payment is valid. So typically I would have another column in here which I would call an audit trail. Or more commonly, I call it reference. And I would have a reference back to the individual document that related to the stationery. So with my invoice, it might be, for example, invoice number 936, 9345. The next one might be invoice 9346. The next one, invoice 9347. And when it comes to my expense, I might have some type of expense, uh, way of filing expenses by month and then by numerical order. So for example, I might sit, talk about the year 20, 2021, February 02, so 2102.1. And that means I'm gonna keep all of my February invoices in a folder electronically or physically and the first one I'm going to call number one. Sorry, it, that, um, let's do that again. And the next one, I might um, have a reference number of two. And as I said, this might be a physical um, filing, or I might file this electronically so that I might, um, this stationery, I might scan it and file it as the file name 2102.1, or I might call it something else, 22.02.soulstationers, for example, or anything that suited me. But the important thing is, I want to be able to trace back to the individual invoice from my accounts. So I want to be able to go from my accounts to look at the sales. I know that my sales come from my cash book. In my cash book, I've got the figure of 2441, which made up of these individual items. And I can go straight back to each one if, say, for example, this one Rewind Limited, if I didn't believe that that £1,000 was paid in February, I can go back to the invoice, see what it says, and see if I'm correct or not. And it could be that there's an error in the accounts, in which case I'd correct it, and it could be there's something going on in my memory, in which case I've refreshed my memory, and I now know the correct position. And if, for example, I was looking at purchases, I see that these two purchases were the purchase of the product um, from Deb Enterprises, sorry, from uh, Maidenhead Wholesalers, and another one from Axial Limited. And I could go back to the individual invoice. This might be, for example, um, uh, 2102.15. And I could go back and check that individual invoice. I've got a, a valid audit trail right the way from my accounts back to my invoices. And actually, I've also got a trail from my invoices through to my accounts. Because if I looked at my invoices alone, 
I can look at the numbers, that they, the, the invoice number, the reference that's on the invoice. I can go to my cash book and find that reference and see where that appears in the accounts. So I can look at this invoice, see I've allocated as purchases. I see the figure in here within purchases, which is part of this figure of 1,478. And when I look at my profit and loss account, um, there's the figure there, 1,478. Um, uh, I can both go forwards from the invoice through to this figure here in the profit and loss account, or backwards from here, back to each of the individual transactions and back via this trail, back to that invoice reference. Okay, that's all I wanted to say on the uh, spreadsheet accounting. The next thing I want to do is to talk to you about how you translate this from a spreadsheet to accounting software. So I'm now going to share a different screen with you. And the software that I'm going to be showing you is something called KPM, C-A-P-I-U-M, KPM. Um, it happens to be either free or an expensive software. Um, at the time we were doing these uh, training sessions, the company has said that anybody using this software as part of this training can use it for free. So they said simply go on, register on their site, download it, apply for the trial session, and they'll just let you keep using it. So don't apply as the accountant, apply it for your own business. And of course, if you start using it regularly, it would be nice if you then start to purchase it. They may change the policy in due course, but for the time being, this is free software. There's plenty of software that's available, ranging from free to reasonably affordable to really expensive. And each one depends on what you're trying to achieve. So I'm simply gonna use this as an example, this KPM, to illustrate how accounting software works. And the principle of cash flow accounting applies equally to computerized accounting as it does to spreadsheet accounting. And the same concept is that we have a whole load of receipts and payments. We need to make meaningful sense of them. And what I've already done, I've pre-entered it, is all of the receipts and payments that I showed in the, um, uh, in the example just beforehand in the spreadsheet, I've typed these out into this, um, this quick entry. And so if you can remember on the 1st of February, actually the dates don't quite tally, but we had Sunshine Traders sale of product, Rewind Limited sale of product, there's that thousand pounds, Harbour Consultants, there's the 200 pounds, then there's this payment we made to Seoul Stations of 17 pounds 23. Now in our spreadsheet, you may have noticed, we showed a plus where we received money and a minus where we paid money out. In KPM, and it, each one, each accounting system has its own quirks, but in KPM, instead of showing it as a plus and minus, I show it as a type of receipt or a payment. So with Sunshine Trade as the sale of products, I showed a receipt of 121 pounds, that's a receipt. And with Soul Station, as I recorded that as a payment. And I've simply listed out all the receipts and payments and I've done nothing else with it. I've got done no, no classification because I wanted to then show you how we move from there to computerized accounts. So I'm now gonna edit this record. So in KPM, having listed all the receipts and payments, the first thing we have to do is to classify them into accounts. So in KPM, if I go to the top of it, you'll see there's a heading. There's a, a, a section for accounts. I've already talked about the description. I've already entered the description, date and description, and the amount as it turns out. This is the account is how I put my classification down. So in this case, I've got, I know that my first item was sales. So I'm going to choose a classification of sales. And it really is as simple as that. The second one down is also sales. So I'm going to classify that as sales. The next one down, Harbour Consultants, also sales. Um, so with different accounting systems, some of them, this will be a drop down list, which you can click and then you'll go through and select it. With KPM, you have to start typing and whatever you type, it looks for any accounts that have got what you've typed. So in KPM, you need to have a bit of an idea what your um, 
expense categories are, and that applies to some software more than others. So particularly when you're getting started, a tip is to print out the chart of accounts, print out the account categories that are available so that you can start to type the one that's most relevant to get to it very quickly. So in the next case of light streamers, it's recharged expenses. I've actually got a category of um, other direct costs. Uh, sorry, I haven't got this. I could have had a category recharged expenses, but I haven't got that. So I'm going to call this sales as well, which is what I did in the other section. But if I had wanted to, I could have created another account, which I called recharge of expenses. And that's how that would put the additional item so that I could change my account categories and then account for it as recharged expenses if I wanted to. But I don't, I simply going to call it sales. So I'm going to click on sales. And then I'm going to go this quite quickly. Soul station is pen and paper, is printing postage and stationery. So I type STA print postage and stationery. I'm going to choose that one. Um, Frank Properties Rent of Warehouse. I type rent and I've got rent of warehouse, rent of office. This one's rent of warehouse. Caps Insurance Brokers Insurance. I've got a warehouse and office insurance. In this case, it's office insurance. Um, Debs Enterprises, I actually can't remember what Debs Enterprises is. I think that was sales as well. And you can see why it's important in the description to put what it is, um, what it is that, that you're receiving or paying the money for. Um, typically, you'd be doing your category at the same time as you do your entry. But if you if you don't put the entry description in, what you'll find is in a month or two's time, you'll look back on this. If you just left it as Debs Enterprises, and here you type sales, someone might say to you, I don't believe that was sales. And the question is, how would you know? So if you've done this properly, there's a column for reference where you can put your audit trail but um, that's a bit fiddly. You'll then have to go back to the document. But if you haven't even got an audit trail, you'd really struggle with finding this and you'd have to sort of hunt around for the invoice and you'd find it. This is why it's important to put a description that's meaningful so that you can validate at a later date if you've accounted correctly for that transaction. So if you've got an accountant looking at this or a manager looking at this and they see that this um, description doesn't tally with sales, they can identify it very quickly without having to go back to the original document. Anyway, in this case, it's sales. The next one, made in wholesale purchase of products. That goes into purchases. Top of like a type. I've got a section for purchases. Um, uh, Aries petrol stations for petrol. Let me see if I've got a petrol. I've got a column for petrol and oil. I've also got a column here for travel. So this is where accounts can be a bit confusing is sometimes you have ambiguous accounts. It doesn't matter what you use as long as you're consistent about it. So in this case, I probably would get rid of the petrol and oil because I don't really want to keep track of that separately from travel. But on the other hand, if I had a, a fleet of uh, a sales, I had a, quite a big sales team, I absolutely would want to know how much we're spending on petrol as distinct from other travel costs, how much we spend on petrol compared with say hotel bills, I might want to tinker with how often we send people to stay at hotels compared with how far away we get them to travel. Uh, in this post-COVID era, um, maybe we want to increase the amount of Zoom meetings we have. So the categories, categories that we have depend on the type of business we want. In the business that I've been talking about, the simple categories, we, did, we had travel as a category, we didn't have petrol and oil. So I'm going to call this travel even though it would have been completely valid to call it oil if we wanted to. But in terms of what I want out of the accounts that I'm creating, I want it to be travel. And I didn't want to separate, separate oil out separately because it's just not important enough for me. And I don't want to confuse the figures with too much tiny numbers. Frank properties rent of offices. Rent of offices, Axial limited purchase of products. So I'm gonna click on purchases. Caps Insurance Brokers, 
And this time it's the insurance of, um, uh, again, I haven't written what it is. I happen to know that this one is the, one is the insurance of the warehouse. So here I would say the warehouse, um, again, I'd probably spell it correctly if I was doing this um, sensibly. Um, and most importantly, whenever I'm entering these in the first place, I'd want to put my reference number. And the rent of the warehouse might be um, 2102.1, and this might be um, 2102.3, for example. The reference is part of the audit trail, so you can go back from the accounts to an individual document, and just in this page alone, this, this quick entry of these accounts, this is my cash book in a very simple format, um, I've got my audit trail back to the individual document, and as I'm entering the entry, what I would enter is, I'd say it was a payment, I would straight away enter the, the reference, the audit trail, I'd straight away call it purchases, I'd put in my meaningful description, I'd put in the date, the amount, and I'd simply save it. And what I've now done is I've done the equivalent of the spreadsheet which is where I've analyzed each of the columns, each of the items into the column that it relates to. But when you use computerized accounting, that is then automatically moved into the profit and loss account. So in this case, I've got a quick report. So I can look at the profit and loss account for the month of February. For last month, we happen to be in March when I'm doing this and um, last month is the month of February. So in the month of February, We've got our sales of 2,431 pounds. Do you remember that's the same figure that we had in the spreadsheet accounts? Our purchase of 1,478 pounds. Our cost of sales in total were 1,928. Gross profit of 502 pounds. Various administrative expenses, rent, insurance, travel, printing, in total 286 pounds. So my total profit is 215 pounds. And that total 215 pounds represents the money that I put into the bank. So if you remember the cash book, when I showed all the receipts and payments, we had 215 pounds. And what we, in accounting terms, when you pay your money into a bank, that puts that into profits. When you pay your money out of account, the bank, it takes it out of profits, so this is the way you get something called double entry bookkeeping, is that the changes in your bank balance should equal your profit or your loss. We're gonna modify that a bit later, but the point of double entry bookkeeping is that any assets or liabilities you have change by reference to the sales or purchases you make in a particular period. We're gonna come back to that in quite a lot more detail. I'm just gonna show you the balance sheet, even though we're gonna talk about it a bit later. And I do apologize, there's some VAT in this, which I would like to remove. Um, ah, I understand what I did. Sorry, I'm gonna go back to this quick entry. Um, I made a mistake with, um, I think I made a mistake. Yes, I did. Um, I'm just gonna very quickly do something, please ignore it. And I'll explain it a bit later. Okay, apologies, uh, uh, just ignore that little bit. I'm gonna come back to show you the balance sheet again. Quick reports, balance sheet. And the balance sheet shows a bank account of 215 pounds. And just as a quick taster into a balance sheet, notice that the profits of 215 pounds equals what's in the bank account. And that's because we started the bank with no money at all. If we had started the, um, yeah, we'll come back to that later. 
Okay, so my bank account's 215 pounds. My profits are 215 pounds. And what I wanted to identify for you is that simply by entering in this quick entry, all my receipts and payments, entering the classification, that and nothing else, I've got my accounts for the month. And here's my accounts. Oh, I'm very happy, I feel very proud of myself. Good, so um, we've talked about how you prepare accounts. We've talked about the audit trail. I want to talk about just one section uh, at this stage, which is only appropriate to people who are in the UK, possibly Europe, or any country where you have uh, something called a value added tax. Um, and it's only appropriate or only important where you're registered for VAT purposes. So if this doesn't apply to you, you can sort of tune out, although it might be quite useful um, in any event just to know about. But in the UK, if you are uh, VAT registered, then whenever you trade all of your sales, you have to add VAT to your sales items. So I'm gonna come back to my quick entry item here. I'm gonna edit it again. So if I was a VAT registered person, when I sold these items to Sunshine Traders, I've charged them 121 pounds 24, but if I was VAT registered, I'd have to charge VAT at 20%. So in addition to the 121 pounds, I would also have to charge them 24 pounds on top of that. They'd have to pay me 145 pounds. If I'm VAT registered and I've purchased some items, if my invoice of 17 pounds 23 has got VAT on it of 20%. So if although, the cost is 17 pounds. I've actually got to pay 20 pounds 67 because in addition to the VAT, in addition to the station, they've charged me three pounds 44. I can reclaim that VAT. So I don't want to get too much into how VAT works other than to say that if you're not VAT registered, the VAT rate always should be zero or select or exempt. And as it happens, you can configure most accounting software to say that you're not VAT registered. And if that's the case, when you're entering a purchase, which includes VAT, if you're not VAT registered, you can't claim that VAT back. It's a cost to you. It doesn't matter whether VAT is charged or not. And actually it's the same as any other sales tax. If you're in any country where you have a sales tax system, when the sales tax is added to the purchase price, it's the, the cost to you is the gross amount. So if you're not that registered, the figure you put in the net amount, if you put zero, zero, zero VAT here, the figure in the net amount should be the total that you pay to your supplier. So 17 pounds 23 is the amount inclusive of VAT, that's what you would put. But if you're VAT registered and the, um, the VAT on that uh, was, um, uh, let me just do it backwards. If we paid 17 pounds 23 and that was 20%, if that we pay that, the computer system will calculate backwards that the VAT amount is two pounds 87, which is the net amount is, is 14 pounds 36. But if there's no VAT, the figure we want to put in the net is the same as the figure in the gross, which is the amount we actually pay to our supplier. So I just simply wanted to say that if you're VAT registered, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna say I am VAT, re VAT registered, and I'm just gonna show these two items of VAT. When I save and close these items, the computer system will automatically keep track of the VAT for you. That is outside the scope of this discussion, but I just want to show you back to the balance sheet. 
show you that we're now showing something slightly different. Not only do we show a bank account of 240 pounds, it's slightly more because we've been paid VAT by Sunshine Traders, but we also owe 21 pounds to the government. What I want you to take out of this is, when you're entering transactions, if you're not that registered, even if VAT is included on an invoice, you do not include VAT in the VAT amount. You do not include VAT, even if it's on the invoice, because computerized accounting systems talk about VAT, not as how much VAT you've paid, but how much VAT is due to the government. So they mean it in a very specific purpose. They're not keeping track of the amount of VAT you've paid as a non-VAT person. So simply if you're not VAT registered, you put the net amount and the gross amount as being the amount you pay to your supplier, regardless of whether it's got VAT or not. If you are VAT registered, you put the net amount being the amount excluding VAT and separately put the VAT rate and the system should calculate for you the VAT amount. And in this case, there's a few different rates that you can charge. One is 20%, another one is 5%. And typically, whichever country you're in, the VAT or the, the sales tax rates that will be applicable will be usually pre-configured and you don't normally have to worry about it. It's normally just a button you can select but almost all of these systems allow you to manually type in the VAT. So for some reason, there's a VAT that's charged by your supplier that's not in the VAT rate. You can normally type in 20 pounds and the system will allow you to put in 20 pounds. Even though it's a strange amount, it's added it to 121 pounds and makes a total of 141 pounds. Um, and you notice here it's already identified that that's a custom VAT. I'm gonna go back to the 20 pounds, um, save and close. So what I wanted to simply identify for you is that if you see VAT, it's only relevant if you're VAT registered. And if you are VAT registered, it's very easy to handle by simply putting the VAT rate in and putting the net amount in the net column and the uh, VAT in the VAT column and the gross in the gross column. And most systems do the calculation for you if you configured it correctly. So, but for one other item, we know how to do a profit and loss account. So the one other item I wanted to show you, to talk to you about, is probably the most important aspect of bookkeeping after the accounting category. And that's the bank reconciliation. And the reason why it's such a big deal, I'm gonna go back to the spreadsheet. If you remember when we first started, let's just hide all of these again. Uh, format, columns, hide. This is what we started off with. Our accounts are built up from these receipts and payments. We've already seen how important the accounts are because we're gonna base all our decisions on how we run the business on what the accounts tell us. The accounts tell us, are we profitable enough? And in due course, do we have enough money to run the business? Do we have enough funding to be able to, to keep us to stay in business? It's absolutely catastrophic if the accounts themselves are wrong because you will make decisions that are wrong based on incorrect information. And the two primary ways accounts can be wrong is firstly, if you allocate the incorrect category to the accounts. So within these accounts classifications, if instead of putting um, purchases in this section, I'd put print state print, printing and stationery. And if I put this not here, but here, our accounts would be wrong. Whether that would be significant is a different question, but they'd be wrong. 
So the first thing is the account classification. And this is partly why the audit trail is such an important part is because it allows us to challenge the classifications and to see if we've got it correct or not. So that's the first primary cause of error. But the other primary cause of error, and this is the one that is just such a big deal, and it's so significant that without this, I would say you cannot do your accounts properly, is if you forget to put an entry, a receipt or payment in your cash book, or you put an entry, but you put the wrong amount. I've put a wrong figure for Sunshine Traders, Look how much I think my sales are. I'm gonna go off and take a holiday next month because I made so much sales. It's just, that's not correct. Those are the wrong sales. My accounts are wrong simply because my cash book is wrong. So the most significant possible um, uh, function of bookkeeping is at an intermediate, intermittent period, say once a week or once a month, depending on how often you use the accounts. But certainly before you look at the account in any meaningful way, you must do a bank reconciliation. And what a bank, bank reconciliation does is it ticks off every item in your cash book against the bank statement to make sure that the amount is correct and that you haven't missed out anything and of course, you haven't duplicated anything. Can you imagine if we duplicated this invoice here? If it was straight underneath, it would be very obvious. But if it was, imagine this is 10 times the number of transactions and we duplicated this somewhere a lot further down, we probably wouldn't pick it up from here. A bank reconciliation says, check off every item in your cash book against the bank statement. And if there's any differences, the chances are there's errors that need correcting. So the final part of this section is, how do you do a bank reconciliation? What I've done here is I've listed all the items in a cash book and all the items on a bank statement. And in this particular example, we've actually started off with some money in the bank and we've ended up with a different amount in the bank. So the figures aren't quite, aren't exactly what they were from beforehand. And again, in the bank statement, we started off with some figures and we've ended up with some figures. And I want you to note that the bank balance itself shows a different amount from our cash book. So on the face of it, if we looked at our bank statement, it looks like we've got a lot less money than we actually have. So either the accounts are incorrect, or there's something in the bank statements which may be incorrect as well. And you think, well, hold on, that can't be right. A bank can't be incorrect. Well, we'll see. There are certain items on a bank statement which are not necessarily errors, but which will be corrected in due course, which means this figure of £432 is a more useful figure for you to have in your mind as to how much money you got, got in the bank, even though you've only got £118 now. We'll come back to that in due course. But what I wanted to say is, your bank statement alone can be very misleading, just as your cash book alone can be very misleading. The key thing is to reconcile, to find out what the difference is between these figures, to identify why the figures are different, and if the cash book is wrong, to correct the cash book, and if the bank statement is wrong, to set it out in a way that you understand what's happening, to make sure that if there's a timing difference, it will reverse. It's also not impossible for a bank to put through a payment, for example, that you haven't instructed. So it is quite conceivable that the bank statement itself may be wrong. And of course, that's something you need to know straight away, get onto your bank saying, why have you made this payment? I didn't instruct it and hopefully get the money back. But the purpose of this exercise is to reconcile the cash book with the bank statement, which means I want to know every individual item in the cash book that's not in the bank statement and every individual item in the bank statement that's not in the cash book and do a statement to list those out so that I can then work out what I need to do. 
And the way a state of reconciliation works is really quite simple. Go through the cash book, and for each item in a cash book, tick it off against an item in the bank statement. So in this example, in the cash book, on the 2nd of February, I've recorded that I've received some money from Sunshine Traders. It only came through on the 7th of February, but I'm doing my reconciliation for the month of February. So the two receipts have come through in the same month. It's the same amount. So I'm gonna put an X, tick, X, Y, whatever I wanted to put in to show that this item has been reconciled. And the reason I'm doing it in both sides is so I know which item I've looked at um, in, in both. Um, the next one, rewind limited, a thousand pounds on the 5th of February. I'm gonna look through my bank statement. Do I see a thousand pounds? And actually I can't find a thousand pounds in my bank statement. I'm looking down it, there's no thousand pounds. Okay, so on the face of it, that looks like that's an error. And what about the 200 pounds from Harbour Consultants? That's not there either. It's a bit strange. Lightstream is 10 pounds. That's not there either. What's happening? Are there three items that didn't actually get banked? Oh, I banked them all on the same date. I put them all through on a single paying in slip. So actually in the bank statement, these three items are gonna appear as a single item. So if you notice these three items total 1,210 pounds, and look on the 10th of February, I've got a bunch of checks, 1,210 pounds. So actually these do reconcile with each other. So I can put an exercise these three amounts. And now this reconciles so far, I'm very happy. The next item, Sol Stationers, 17 pounds 23. Yep, I can see that. Sol Stationers here and Sol Stationers here. The amount's correct, the month is correct. I can tick those off. Just a tip, when you're doing this reconciliation, it's really important you don't tick off an item that doesn't reconcile. Sounds really stupid, but it's really important, for example, I don't tick off Deb's Enterprise if there is not an equal and opposite Deb's Enterprise here, or if I forget to tick both sides. If I type an entry which doesn't have a corresponding entry, you will never get your items to reconcile you're simply gonna to have to start again from scratch. If you're dealing with 10 transactions, that's not a big deal. If you're dealing with 100 transactions, it's a really frustrating process. Be really careful when you're doing a reconciliation to make sure you always tick both sides, both the cash book and the bank statement, and you only ever tick it if it's correct. And I want to identify something which happens very frequently which is if you've got a lot of sales items that are the same, each one for say 10 pounds or $30, maybe you've got a cinema and you, you're charging ticket entry points and you have loads and loads and loads and loads of entries of the same amount. It's very easy to tick off an item from one person for $10 against an item, a receipt from somebody else for $10 in the, in the bank statement. So you're actually ticking the wrong items off against each other. So uh, when you're doing your bank reconciliation, do be aware there's a few gotchas. Be really careful only to tick off items that record the tally and to make sure you tick off both items at the same time. And again, typically if Deb's Enterprises shows us twice in the cash book, but once in the bank statements, and if Deb, Deb's Enterprises in several different places, it's very tempting to say, okay, these tick, good here. And then quite a bit lower down in my cash book, I find Deb's Enterprises again. I say, oh, I remember Deb Enterprises. Oh, I've got it in here. Yes, look here, I've ticked this incorrectly. So I'm now gonna go back and tick it lower down. It's very easy to do that. And again, you'll find your reconciliation won't reconcile because what you've actually done is entered Deb Enterprises twice. When you came to reconcile it the second time because you remembered it in the bank statement, you made a wrong conclusion that you ticked that off incorrectly. So the tip is, when you are reconciling these items, be absolutely certain that they reconcile. You're better off not ticking an item if you're not absolutely sure and leaving them both outstanding because it's much easier to sort that out in the reconciliation than it is 
if you've incorrectly ticked off an item where, you're at, where your reconciliation doesn't reconcile in the first place. So with that tip, CAPS insurance brokers ticks off. Um, uh, Note Frank Properties, I jumped for that 225 pounds. If I look through here, I can't find any payment. Oh, I can for 225 for Frank Properties. Beg your pardon, I can tick that off. Um, Frank Properties X there, X there. Um, Windsor and Maidenhead, 865 pounds. Yup, I can see that, that ticks off here and here. Frank Properties, 151 pounds. Yup, I can see those as well. HCL, 613 pounds. Yup, for some reason, notice in the bank statements on 8th of February, but in my cash book on the 24th of February, the reason for that, as it turns out, is this came through by bank transfer. They didn't tell me about it. And I only found out about it on the 24th of February um, when I was chasing them up to say, um, you haven't delivered some goods. Um, and they said, uh, um, sorry, uh, never mind. It came through the bank statements with this particular example. Um, forgot about to record it. We've now recorded a later date, but it still ticks off. And that's it. There's a few items on here that are not ticked. There's 554 pounds, which is some type of payment, which is not being recorded. There's 15 pounds 10 of interest on the bank statement, which is not being recorded. There's a 45 pounds 22 payment, which is not being recorded. There's an item that has been recorded that's not in the bank statement. So remember that my cash book shows 432 pounds, my bank statement shows 118 pounds. Based on what I now know, I want to reconcile these two figures. I want to say, what do I need to do to change that figure into that figure with transactions? And I'm now going to show you how you create a bank reconciliation. The bank reconciliation is split into two columns. You start off with a column of the figure for your bank statement. This is 118 pounds. That's this 118 pounds here that's in the bank statement. You start off with a balance per the bank statement and beside it, you have a separate column balance per the account, so 432 pounds. There's the 432 pounds. Then I'm gonna go through each unreconciled item and I'm gonna put it in the one of four boxes. I'm gonna have a box in my bank statements, my bank column, for anything which is a payment in the bank statement, but which has not been, start again. This is a payment in the cash book, but which has not yet hit the bank statement. So this 225 pounds is this 225 pounds here. It's a payment that went through, that we paid on the 28th of February, but at the end of February, that 225 pounds has not cleared. Notice this 225 pounds for Frank properties, it's the same amount, but this amount has been ticked because we'd recorded a different 225 pounds earlier in the month. So this is what I was warning you about. Be careful about jumping to conclusions if you see unreconciled items but we have got a payment for, to CAPS insurance brokers in the cash book that has not appeared in the bank statement. This is because CAPS insurance brokers, uh, we pay them by check. It took a few days for the check to arrive and that check will only clear in March. So if I come to my reconciliation, my bank statement of 118 pounds is going to change once that unreconciled item has cleared. So I've got a column for unpresented payments in my bank column. This is anything that I've got in my cash book, which is a payment which is going to appear in due course in future months in my bank statements, but is not there now. And I'm putting it in this column on the basis that if it had cleared through in February, it would have reduced the bank statement to an overdraft of 106 pounds. That's what would have happened if that had been recorded, uh, happened correctly. If I'd got any receipts, so somebody had paid some money into us, we'd recorded in our bank cash book, 
but it hadn't yet appeared in the bank statement, again, because of timing differences. We'd received some checks, we sent it through, sent it by post to the bank. It clears in two or three days time. That would have appeared as unpresented receipts. That would have increased our bank statement if that had been recorded. But there aren't any in this particular case. So my bank statement has all, I've filled in all the boxes I want to for my bank statement column. I've now got a the cash book column where I'm gonna start off with the figures that are in the accounts. And I'm gonna adjust that now with items in the bank statements, which show that the accounts are incorrect. So in this case, I've got bank statements. I've showed interest of 15 pounds and 10 P. That interest has not yet been recorded in the cash book. So when I um, go to this column, I'm saying, are there any receipts in the bank statements that have not yet been recorded in the cash book? And if so, I need to add them to the cash book in order to get what the correct figure would be. So I need to add the 15 pounds 10 of interest that will increase this bank um, balance of 432 pounds. It'll increase it by 15 pounds if I had recorded it correctly. But also there's a payment of 554 pounds that I haven't recorded. There's 554 pounds that are, that's on the bank statement that I've forgotten to record in my cash book. When I record it in my cash book, that will reduce the balance in my cash book. And look, when I correct my bank statements, the corrected figure should be 106 pounds overdraft. When I correct my cash book, the corrected cash book should show an overdraft of 106 pounds. I've reconciled my bank statements and my accounts. And I've now got all of the differences and I can use these differences to see what I should do to correct the position. The question I now ask myself is, do I need to correct the accounts with these unpresented payments? And the answer is no. This will be corrected once the bank, once the check has reached the bank and they've accounted for it. That's not an accounting adjustment. That's not an error in the accounts. It's simply a timing difference. It's a difference. The bank statement doesn't show me the correct position of what the bank will be when everything's gone through, but it's not an error, so I don't need to adjust the accounts. Conversely, everything in this column, the balance per the accounts, is an error in the accounts. And if I was now um, doing this properly, I would go through the accounts, I would record this interest, I'd then record this bank payment. When I had done this, my cash book would then be updated to show 106 pounds overdrawn. That would be updated if I should put these extra entries through. And again, so that my balance for the account would show minus 106.14, no reconciling items because my accounts are now correct. And my corrected balance in the reconciliation shows 106 pounds. Um, again, I would uh, repeat the purpose of the reconciliation is to pick up errors in your accounts, either because you've recorded the wrong amounts or you've missed out an item in your account that should be there, or you've duplicated. If we had duplicated an entry, you'd have a tick for one of them, not for the other. That would appear in this reconciling item. And you could simply show, um, um, an entry in the accounts, uh, you might actually have another one, not unrecorded, but duplicated um, payments. Uh, and um, that would be part of the reconciliation. And then off the basis of that, you then correct the accounts, you'd redo the reconciliation now that the accounts are corrected. And your reconciliation, again, I would stress, is probably the single most important dimension of accounting after the classification of the accounts themselves. Once you've reconciled, I just want to highlight one other point. Do you remember we were talking beforehand saying, which is correct, the cash book balance of 432 pounds or the bank statements of 118 pounds? The answer is neither. The answer is 
once everything's gone through, we've got an overdraft of 106 pounds. If we don't have an authorized overdraft, this information is intensely useful because even though the bank don't know it yet, we're about to go overdrawn and we might start to incur a lot of costs if they won't allow us to have un, uh, unrecorded, uh, um, uh, unauthorized overdraft. So straight away, this reconciliation is particularly useful because neither the cash book nor the bank statement was correct until we've done the reconciliation. Once we've done the reconciliation, the chances are the cash book, the corrected cash book, is the one you can rely on. I'm going to go back to the presentation now. We've come a long way. We've talked about what accounts are. We've talked about the idea of accounts being to help you identify whether you're making enough profits. We've looked both at how you use a spreadsheet and a computerized uh, uh, accounting software to produce accounts. And what you're ending up with is some meaningful information by which you can see are your sales greater or less than your costs. What are your profits? In this particular example, we're comparing this year's profits, 2021, against last year's profits by looking at how our sales have changed and how our costs of sales have changed. And our profits have gone up from 10,000 to 22,000 pounds. You've reached by far, you've gone far more than halfway through this training session. But I'm delighted that if you want to stop now, you can now prepare cash flow accounting just on what you've seen so far. So congratulations. So the next part of this uh, training session is invoice accounting. What we're going to cover in invoice accounting is we're going to talk about invoicing and how um, invoicing is all about accounting for timing, how we create and account for invoices using accounting software. I'm not going to waste time doing it on the spreadsheet accounting because it's so much better using computer accounting if you're going to do invoices. We'll have a quick look at debtors and creditors. We'll touch on VAT again, talk briefly about system configurations, and we'll look at a couple of invoice requirements just so you know how to create a valid invoice. First, let's look at the principles of invoice accounting. In this example, we've got some transactions that happen in both January and February and March. And in the month of February, we sell 10 tractors for 20,000 pounds. But the cash flows happen in a very different way. The cash flows arise, we sell, we get cash for one tractor of 1,500 pounds in January. As it happens, the customer's paying us in advance because they want to make sure that we don't sell that tractor to somebody else. So they pay us for the tractor in January, but we deliver it in February. We then receive another 9,500 pounds for four tractors. So, so far we've received money for five tractors, but we've sold 10 of them. And what's happening is the final five tractors that we sold in February, we're only going to be paid for in March. So if we're doing cash accounting, our cash accounts would show sales in January of 1,500 pounds, sales in February of 9,500 pounds, and sales in March of 9,000 pounds. But actually, that doesn't reflect reality. The reality is we sold all of those tractors in February. Now, I've isolated out the February transactions from everything else, and I'm pretending there's no transactions in January, there's no sales in January, and there's no sales in March. And this is just to help you keep track of what's going on. 
you can see that if there were sales in January and March as well, the cash flow accounting would give you an incorrect assessment of what your sales were for January and February and March. Invoice accounting is how you fix that problem. And the way it works is it, sa it says, if you're accounting, um, uh, when you sell your tractors, you're gonna raise a sales invoice. And this is the critical bit, on the date on the invoice, the invoice date should equal the date of the sale. So if you've got someone coming into a warehouse, uh, into a, a car showroom, and they're gonna buy um, cars from you, some of them will pay you there and then, but some of them will pay you later. What you need to do is you raise an invoice and the invoice is the basis on which you're gonna do your accounting. And in invoice accounting, you account for invoices in the month in which the invoice is dated, not the month in which you receive or pay or receive the money. So I'm gonna give you an example. I'm gonna go back to the accounting software of KPM and show you how that works in practice. So, do you remember in our quick entry, we had a sale of a thousand pounds from Rewind Limited, which we received on the 1st of February. I'm going to pretend that everything else is recorded in the correct month, except Rewind Limited. And I want to say that we actually sold them that product in January. They came in January, they took the payment in January, sorry, they took the product in January, they paid for it in February. How do we account? How do we switch the way of accounting so that we, even though we receive the money in February, we account for the sale in January? It starts with the invoicing. So in all accounting software, you're gonna have a sales section. And in the sales section, there's the option for you to raise an invoice. And in this case, I'm saying you're gonna raise a new invoice. And the invoice you're gonna rate is to Rewind Limited. Typically, there's a lot of information you can enter with um, invoices. You can put in an invoice number, that's the audit trail or the reference number that relating to the invoice itself. You can type it in. Most accounting software has its own invoice numbering system and a lot of people use that number. So if you were doing that, you'd want to make sure that invoice number appeared in the invoice and when you file the invoice somewhere, you use this accounting reference system so you can find it later. The date is, let's say, the 13th of January. That's the date of the invoice because that's the month in which they picked up the item. So this is the generic data that I'm putting on all the invoice. There's various other bits of information I could put in. I could put in some notes if I wanted to put in the invoice. If I wanted to put a note to a customer, I could do that there. Um, notice with VAT, if I'm VAT registered, I can put in bits of information about VAT. Um, if I wanted to apply a discount, I can do so, but I'm going to keep it simple in this case. Um, and I'm going to um, identify what it is that I'm selling. And what it is that I'm selling is the way that I can put in my account category so that my accounts will be recorded correctly. So in this case, I'm gonna put in an item and in the items that I've got, uh, sorry, cancel that. I'm gonna select an item. This one's a drop down list. And I'm gonna select, in this case, I'm selling a tractor model 200V. So it's, the description has been pre-configured. I have already configured the system that if I have tractors 200V, it will put this description in, but I could just as easily overwrite it or add to it, say I could put, for example, um, a vehicle ID number, and then put some type of number which is tattooed or, or, or marked on the engine, for example, if I wanted to do so. So I can update the description if I want to. 
I can put the number of items I'm selling. In this case, it's 100 items. Uh, it's one item for £1,000. I'm going to have no VAT because I'm not that registered. If I were, I could simply put my VAT figures in here and the system will take care of the VAT for me. But I'm not registered for that. If I configured KPM correctly to show that I'm uh, not a that registered person, it would have given me the correct defaults with all of these. But here in the account, I can select which account I want to allocate it to. So in, in our example, I'm calling everything sales. But if I've got a separate account called vehicle sales, I could have classified it as vehicle sales instead. I'm going to call it sales to be consistent with everything else that we've done beforehand. So, so far I've recorded a thousand pounds that's now owed to us by the customer. Now, as it happens, when I save this, this will automatically create an invoice, which I can send to the customer. I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. There's one other point I wanted to highlight to you, which is this section here, which talks about receipt. And what this allows you to do is to raise an invoice where you can distinguish between whether it's a debtor, which is an invoice which you're raising where you're not being paid immediately. And in this case, the whole of the, th the thousand pounds I'm allocating to trade debtors, or if some of it is going to go to my bank account. So if I wanted to raise an invoice where I'm being paid there and then on the spot, I could go through to my invoicing section, raise my invoice. I can enter my account classification. Remember, that's the critical bit about how I do my accounts. And I could select here that I want to put it to my bank account, not to my trade debtors. And this would be identical from putting it through a quick entry. I could put it in here in exactly the same way as the quick entry and exactly, it will, both will appear in exactly the same place in the accounts. However, in this case, I'm going to say it doesn't appear, get straight paid to our bank. Instead, all of it's being paid, all of it's being paid to trade debtors. So not being paid to, all of it is a debtor. So that this thousand pounds, as soon as I've raised the invoice, I'm allowing them to have the goods. I'm recording the sale in this month. So I'm adding to my profits in the month of January, but I'm not adding to my bank balance. Instead, I'm adding to my debtors. So the system handles all of this for me. I'm just identifying what happens. I'm going to save this, save and close. And just to buy the buy, with all accounting systems, they will allow you to display an invoice in a formatted way. And one of the things you can do, so this is the invoice that I've just raised. Notice this invoice date is the 13th of January. With KPM, I've actually got to identify, in order to list the invoices, it always lists invoices within a particular period. So I had to make sure that my, the period covered the invoice I wanted to list. But in this case, this is showing me that I've got an invoice of a thousand pounds its status is that it's still owing. And one of the actions I can select is download a PDF. And if I were to do this, the PDF will be a properly formatted invoice, which I can then send to the customer or print off. And all accounting systems have this facility where you can create your invoice from the accounting system. And this alone is very useful. If you're that registered, it's particularly useful because you have a legal requirement to give a VAT invoice with a particular format. Even if you're not that registered, any business needs to be able to, needs to give a sales invoice for tax purposes. So this is an automatically done for you with an accounting system. And, um, uh, and if I want to go back and look at the invoice again, I can just go into it, see the figures, I can edit it to make any changes I want to. And I now want to show you what happens in the profit and loss account based on these, um, this transaction. I'm going to look at my profit and loss account just for January. Uh, in fact, let me do it for... So 
So I'm just going to display the January accounts. And in my January accounts, I've now got sales of a thousand pounds when beforehand I had no sales at all. And I've got the sales there because I've raised the invoice. And if you remember beforehand, I had recorded that invoice in February because I'd received the money in February, but with invoice accounting, I'm not showing it in February, I'm now showing it in January. And I want to show you the balance sheet for January, even though we've not covered balance sheet just yet. So the balance sheet as at the end of January shows my profit of a thousand pounds. I added a thousand pounds to profit, but I didn't add the thousand pounds to the bank. I didn't increase my debtors. I didn't debit my bank account. Instead, I created a debtor of a thousand pounds. So we'll cover balance sheets in another module, but I just wanted to highlight for you that in January, everything is now working correctly, even though we don't have the money in the bank. We do have our profits showing in January. Now I want to come back to February. So notice that we've got profits of a thousand pounds in January from, um, uh, in January. Um, let me go back to that quick entry that we put through from Rewind Limited. So this entry for Rewind Limited, I'm showing a receipt in February of a thousand pounds. What's what's happening? This is double counting the sale. We've already accounted for the sale. So this sale, if we leave this receipt in sales, we're double counting it. So there's something clearly we need to do, which is different to avoid double counting the sales. So the money's come into our bank account, it's a valid receipt, that's correct, but it's not a sale in February. What's actually happened is that money that's come in is the money that's come in from a debtor. Our debtor is no longer a debtor once we've received the money. So on the 1st of February, instead of receiving a thousand pounds, which gets added to sales, added to profits, that thousand pounds reduces our debtors we debit bank, we credit trade debtors. So here, what I really want to put in is a figure for trade debtors. And when I do this, it will, um, uh, instead of putting that receipt to the profit and loss account, it'll put it to produce to trade debtors. And now my accounts are going to be correct because this figure no longer shows receipts. If I'm going to do that, it's really important I put here the name of the customer or supplier. In this case, it's Rewind Limited. If I don't allocate it to Rewind Limited, the, the system doesn't know that it was Rewind Limited that paid this money to us. It could have been any debtor. So by allocating it as Rewind, we've now said to the system, this receipt is not a sale, it's a payment of a trade debtor, we're paying off our customer Rewind Limited. And if we post this, our trade debtor will eliminate. We haven't double counted. We have not double counted our sale. And if you look at the profit and loss account, our profit and loss account comes back correctly to 200 pounds. And of our sales figure, notice this goes from the whole period from um, April last year to now, our sales figure of 2,400 pounds. If I show the figure just for January, my profits are still gonna show a thousand pounds, but if I show just February alone, if I go to the, from the 1st of February to the end of February, so I show just February alone, My sales, instead of being 2,431 for February alone, they're 1,431 because I haven't double counted that thousand pounds. And now in this month, notice I've got a loss. I've correctly shown a thousand pound sales in January and a loss in February. This is important information. What have I done in February that I've lost money? On the face of it, I've made money in February. 
when I did the, my cash flow accounting, it simply was wrong. And if I show my cumulative profits, where I show both the January and February added together, so go back to the beginning of January, my cumulative figure is correct, 218 pounds. But now my accounts distinguish the profits from January from the profits in February, not just by reference to the cash flow accounting, but I've adjusted it for invoices. So where I've raised an invoice, which shows a sale in a different month, I'm accounting for it in the month of the sale based on the invoice, not based on the date of receipt. But I've had to be careful that when I then receive the money, I have to remember to account for it, not as a receipt to sales, but as a receipt against trade debtors. And let me just identify that there's actually a very neat way that all accounting systems have got for you to enter receipts. You would actually never enter a receipt in quick entry. What you typically would do is go to your sales, go to the invoices, and um, let me go back to uh, uh, display them all. So in this particular case, um, I would typically, if I'd receive money from Rewind Limited, there's a section here that says add receipt. So rather than entering in quick entry, I'd go to the add receipt section. And this is where I would put the date of the receipt. In this case, it was the 1st of February. I put all my various details here. And when I saved it, that would automatically show that I've received this money. It would put the money to the bank correctly and it would account for the debtors correctly. And I wouldn't have to enter it again in the quick entry section. So accounting systems, when you're doing invoicing, allow you to enter sales. And in the sales section, critical bits they allow you to do is to enter invoices, enter receipts, either by going into the invoice itself or going to the receipt section. If you go to the receipt section, typically you would list all the unpaid invoices. You can select the invoices that have been paid. Various other ways you can do it. You can do it by customer. Um, and the other thing that's really neat is that if you do this, when you look at reports, you can then look at your sales reports, which will list you list for you all the sales you made in the month. It also allows you to look at something called a customer aging list. And this customer aging list lists all your debtors. It says how much each of them owes and how old each debt is. So in this case, there are no debtors because we've recorded Rewind Limited as having paid it, paid it off. But this is a particularly useful report if you need to chase debtors that haven't yet paid you. So all accounting systems allow you to keep track of invoices and unpaid invoices and even how old invoices are. You can go into each account and it'll tell you all the invoices and payments relating to that particular account. In this case, there aren't any. You can usually print out, um, uh, I can't remember how you do it here. But you can usually print out a statement which you can send to your supplier, uh, to your customer. Say, here, these amounts are outstanding. This is how old it is, please pay us. So a computerized, a computerized accounting system for the sake of simply entering invoices in the sales section, all of that functionality comes to, to bear to you, which is raising invoices, sending out statutorily uh, compliance invoices, identifying what debts you've got are outstanding, chasing outstanding debtors. All of that functionality is managed just with the uh, computerized accounting. And by recording sales in the month in which the invoice is dated rather than the month in which you receive it you've moved from a pure cash accounting cash flow accounting system to an invoice accounting system and i don't know if it's stands it's obvious or stands to reason but there's a similar section for purchases which is a mirror image of your sales systems that when you go into the purchase system you can enter purchases which allows you to record purchases, not in the month in which you pay them, but the month in which you receive the invoice or the month in which the invoice is dated. 
And typically that's more reliable in terms of understanding what your accounts are. So for the sake of recording your invoices through um, your purchase invoices through this section, rather than doing it on a payments basis, you've switched from a cash flow accounting system to an invoice accounting system to get the benefit of accounting for stuff in the month in which you've bought the goods rather than the month in which you paid them, which is more reliable in terms of the accounting system. Um, the same thing applies with purchases. If you've collated quite a few purchases, you can look at uh, a report, for example, of all creditors, all your suppliers, um, list out the suppliers that you've got and you can I, perhaps go through rather than pay a supply, rather than pay them on an invoice by invoice basis, you might pay a bunch of invoices if the, you've got the same supplier they supply regularly. Um, and you can simply send out a statement to them saying, here, I'm paying these invoices. Here's the total amount that we've paid you. And the system will allow you to do all of that. So for by simply switching from entering the payments as you make the payment to entering invoices, sales invoices and purchases, when you receive the invoices, you both improve the quality of your accounts and you also have this huge amount of functionality in terms of managing and keeping track of your debtors and creditors. And I just wanted to reiterate again, that when you enter your sales and purchases, if you're a VAT registered person, remember to include the VAT and the system will keep track of VAT for you. And if you're not VAT registered, even if an invoice shows VAT, include the amount, in, don't include anything in the VAT column because you can't recover the VAT and you're not adding VAT to your invoices. So that's the, that's the tip. Can we go back to the presentation? Okay, so you've sorted out this principle of how you're recording based on the invoice dates instead of the receipts and payments dates. And we've also shown how you avoid double counting by switching the receipts, in this case, or payments, if you're talking about to payments, instead of allocating the receipts or payments to an account category, to a profit and loss account item, instead of that, you allocate it to debtors or creditors, and that's the way by which you can account for things in the month in which the sale happens or the purchase happens rather than the month in which you pay it. I just wanted to highlight one point for you, which is if you're um, sending out an invoice to someone, there's various legal requirements about what's in an invoice. And it includes things like saying it is a sales invoice, um, your name, the customer's name, the invoice number, invoice date. You need to identify what you're selling. If you're VAT registered, you need to separate out the amount of VAT you're charging and separately show the gross amount inclusive of VAT they owe you. You have to incorporate your VAT number somewhere on the invoice. Good practice is to incorporate your bank details. This is so they can pay you. Um, terms of trade, if you expect people to pay you on, on uh, delivery of invoice, you should say that on, the, on your invoice. If you're giving them 30 days to pay, you should put that on the invoice. But the terms you put on the invoice are useful because it allows you, when you're debt collecting, if your debtor has not paid you in time, it allows you to refer back to the invoice to say you're now overdue and to encourage them to pay you. And if you're a limited company, you need to put the registered name of the company, registered office, and your company registered number. So I just wanted to identify that if you're doing, um, if you're sending out invoices, do be aware of the legal requirements for raising invoices. And with all the computerized accounting systems, there are various configurations you can put through where you can set up different customers, different suppliers. You can put out different items that you sell. You can set out prices. And you can do all sorts of stuff to make creating invoices much easier. With some 
um, systems, you can even um, tailor how the invoice looks. So you can include your logo, for example, you can change the layout of how, where the address appears, you can make it much more sympathetic to your type of business. You can, some invoicing systems have more modern styles, some have more um, traditional styles, so you can pick what suits you. But in computer accounting systems, in addition, you'll need to configure your sales system and your purchase system. But once you've done that, it then becomes relatively trivial using this to raise invoices, to account for invoices, and to move to invoice accounting. So that's the end of this section. Thank you for listening to that.